Well, good morning. We have a very limited amount of time this morning, and I'm going to tell you straight up front, if you didn't get your coffee this morning, you're in deep trouble. Uh, this is not a sermon. Uh, this is not going to be an amen fest. I am not going to uh, make you all a walk out of here on an emotional high or a spiritual high or anything else. Uh, this is a lecture, and I do not apologize for that, at least not in the sense we use that uh, today. I will give you a classical apology for it. We can profess our love for the Word of God. We can confess its authority. We can proclaim its authority. But the reality is that the apostles went into the, the marketplace. They went into the area of debate. They reasoned with people. And they gave a defense of their faith. And we can talk about how the Bible is consistent, but it would be very good if in talking about that we are able to demonstrate that we've thought through what we're saying about that. And so this morning is quite simply, uh, I'm taking on the role of seminary professor. That's what I do a lot. And you are the class. There will be a test at the end. You cannot leave the room until you pass. So, uh, and Vody Balcom will be at the doors uh, if you try to get out. <clears throat> That makes it quite serious. So, um, harmonization. Harmonization. What in the world am I talking about? Well, when I went to Fuller Theological Seminary in the New Testament classes, the one option that was not allowed when you were talking about tensions in the text was to harmonize the text. And, and the argument basically was this. Well, when you harmonize Matthew with Mark, you no longer have Matthew and you no longer have Mark. You now have so, a, a strange intermixture of the two. And they would point to, for example, those people in the early church that, that created a single gospel by cobbling together parts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they would argue, you no longer have Matthew, you no longer have Mark, you no longer, longer have Luke. You don't have what they were intending to communicate. And on that level, they would be true. They would be, they would be right, because we don't want to conflate the gospels together into one gospel, but we do want to allow them to speak and to speak truthfully, and to speak with their own style and their own language and all those things. But the one option that was never allowed was to, was to go, well, what if John was talking about this and Matthew was talking about this, and they're all describing the same event from different perspectives? What if Matthew has his audience that he's trying to communicate with, so he emphasizes certain things, and, and so on and so forth? That was the one option that was not allowed. And I say to you, it is the option that takes the most work, and it is the option that is the only one available to us who believe that God has spoken in Scripture. And so it is something we need to learn to think about. It's something we need to learn to do, and that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Now, let's take a look at some of the presuppositions. I told you, get a deep seat in the saddle, get your pen out, because we're going to be moving at lightning speed, but I'm really hoping that what this will do is provide you with some food for thought and some foundations for further study uh, on your own. There's some good stuff out there, and there's some not-so-good stuff out there, so uh, be aware of that. If there's some way to pop that up on the screen back there, that would be, that'd be great for me. Now, presuppositions. Generally, when we start talking especially about the issue of harmonizing the Gospels, and I would highly recommend to you, uh, if possible, uh, obtain for yourself a parallel of the Gospels where you can look at Matthew in one column and Mark in the next column and Luke and then John, and so you can see what the differences are. I think it's important to do that mainly because our critics are doing that and they're going to throw this stuff at us, and if we don't talk about it here, we're going to be running into it out there, and that's not the time to be running into it, okay? So get yourself a harmony of the Gospels, and when you look at the relationships, uh, look at it in that, in that fashion, and what it raises is the question, well, what do we have in the Gospels? What do we have in the Gospels? Is this meant to be uh, a, a, a journalistic recording of, of the exact words of Jesus, like if someone was staying there with an MP3 recorder? Is, is that what we have? And so we have some terms up here. Generally, the, the conversation breaks down into the first two, ipsissima of ox and ipsissima of verba. What does that mean? Well, generally, theologians like to use Latin because they're weird and uh, because people in the past did that. Uh, in fact, you used to have advertisements in Latin. That's how wild, widely uh, used it was, and it's not so widely used anymore. But we still use the, the terms, absistum of vox and absistum of verba. Do we have the very voice of Jesus or the very words of Jesus? And that's generally what, what it breaks down to because the fact of the matter is when you... Uh, when you look at parallel accounts for, for the same 
subject, the same uh, event in Jesus' life. In Matthew, Jesus will say slightly different words than he does in Mark or in Luke. Sometimes it's identical, sometimes it's not. And so the question is, do we have the exact words or are we hearing the voice? The voice being the idea that, well, in most of Jesus' teaching, he probably wasn't speaking Koine Greek. He was probably speaking what would be called Aramaic. And we have that written down for us in Greek. And so if Matthew is giving us his translation of the Aramaic, that might be different than Mark's translation of the Aramaic or Luke's translation of the Aramaic or something along those lines. And so that's one possible place where there might be difference, but some of the differences would not be accounted for by mere translation. And so the question is, is it the voice or is it the words? And I would like to suggest that going with that limits us too much. I don't know that those, using those as the only two options accurately reflects why it is we have four Gospels in the first place. Why did the Spirit of God give us four Gospels? It would have been a whole lot easier for me as an apologist to have one, except for certain instances where having another Gospel has shed absolutely vitally important light on something that was said in another Gospel. Uh, so I, I guess even then it, 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 it's, it's good that we have them. But my, it's, it's a challenging thing to bring them together and to read them in, in parallel with one another and to understand these things. I would like to suggest a, a third category, ipsissima, ipsissima intendibant. What does that mean? The intended, the intention, the exact intention that God desired us to have, the very words he intended us to, present, to, to have and to have in the text. Why is that? Well, I don't think that it's appropriate for us to expect Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to be written by the standards of Western journalism. Well, of course, journalism today, whatever that is. But, but Western uh, MP3 recordings, uh, that type of a thing. Because no one was, was standing around with a, with a steno pad taking shorthand or anything like that to try to do what you do in a law court, you know, sit there with a the thing and taking down the exact words and that kind of stuff. That's not what was going on. But what we need to remember is what is the locus of inspiration in the Bible? What did we say yesterday? All Scripture is God-breathed. The process leading up to it, all that stuff is left, that's, that's, that's God's thing, but what is God-breathed is the result of all that. Somehow he superintends all of that so that the result is exactly what he wants. And so what we have in Matthew's version of a story and what we have in Mark's version of a story is intended by God for some reason. And even when there are differences we can be confident that the difference is there to teach us something or to show us something. If we don't have that, then we're left with what most liberals do today, and that is they look at the differences, especially amongst the synoptic gospels, and they start psychoanalyzing Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And well, I wonder why Matthew changed Mark here. Well, probably because of his background, and he had a prejudice against this, and, and that they're stuck with just doing psychoanalysis. That's not going to get us anywhere. But if we do believe that God gave us these scriptures for our edification, for a purpose, then we have a reason for looking at them very, very closely and trying to learn what these things are saying to us. Now, let's, let's take a look at an example. Uh, I should have put the reference up here. I apologize. Look at Matthew chapter 9 and Mark chapter 5. This is where a parallel would help. This is the story of the raising of Lazarus' daughter, and let me see here, okay, Matthew 9, 18, and Mark 5, 22 following is the, uh, is the reference here. I'd like to introduce you to a, a concept that will, that will sort of stand for many other uh, examples that we could give as we examine the Synoptic Gospels especially, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Synopteo, to see alike, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke looking the same way, John's very different. Uh, in his ordering and, and in, his, in his approach, so he's not considered a synoptic gospel. Let me give you an example of why I believe that we need to look at these gospels and allow the writers to have the freedom to express their story the way that they choose to do so. Let me give you an example. How many of you in here are planning on writing a, have already or will be writing a, some sort of blog entry or Facebook entry about your time at the G3 conference? All right, now let me ask you something. Unless every single one of those blogs is identical, are you all, are you all liars? Will any of those blog entries be identical to another blog entry word for word? 
But are you all in this room? Okay, so the fact of the matter is, as you're observing me right now and listening to me right now, if you blog what I, what I said today, you're all going to put something different, aren't you? And some of the ladies are going to be distracted by uh, the weirdness of my bow ties and things like that. And uh, some of the guys are going to be distracted by the use of, of, of overheads and things like that. They're going to focus on different things. There's going to be differences, and also depending upon what you want to communicate. If you happen to like me, you might be nice about what I say. If you don't happen to like me, you might not be, and so you're going to focus on different things. There's going to be different purposes for which you're writing each one of your blogs. Well, when we look at the Gospels, we know Matthew's writing for one audience, Mark's writing for a different audience. We look at the length of the Gospels, Mark is much shorter than Matthew. But interestingly enough, when Matthew and Mark are telling the same story, invariably, Mark tells it more fully. And Matthew tells it in much shorter words. For example, this particular story, the healing of Jairus' daughter. Remember, he comes to Jesus, and Jesus is going to heal his daughter, and the woman with the issue of blood comes up and touches his garment, and then the men come from the house and tell him she's died, and Jesus says, don't worry, and, and they go to the house, and he raises her up. We all know the story, generally. But what I just did was mix together what Matthew and Mark said. There were some elements of that that were in Matthew that weren't, well, there's some elements that were in, in Mark that were not in Matthew in what I just said. And so when we look at it, Matthew uses only 139 words over only eight verses to narrate this event. Mark uses 379 words over 22 verses to narrate this event. I mean, when your book's only 16 chapters long, he spends a lot of time on this one. And so Matthew's version is only 37% the length of Mark's, or to look at it the other way, Mark's version is 2.7 times longer than Matthew's. So what does that tell us? Well, when we look at this particular instance, Mark is giving us more information. That means Matthew is summarizing. He's summarizing things. And all of you, if you're going to write a blog about this presentation, you're going to have to summarize what I'm saying. Unless you're recording it, you're just going to post the video, right? That's not an option in that, in that time period. And so who gets to choose what you summarize? And when you summarize something, are you going to summarize by topic or by chronological order? Well, that's up to you. It, 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 you might choose, someone might choose that to, to summarize by chronological order is going to make more sense than by topic. And other people, no, 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 I'm, I'm just going to talk about the topics first and whether he's addressed that first or last or somewhere in the middle, doesn't matter. All depends on what you think you can do best in communicating this particular, uh, this particular event. And that's what we have here. What Matthew is going to do in this this material is to telescope. Remember, I'm not sure if they really have many of them today, but when I was a kid, you would have these telescopes that you could pull out. Remember like the old uh, pirate thing, you know, the Peter Pan pirate thing, you know, and uh, it, would, it would pull out or, or go together in segments, okay? Well, that's what Matthew's doing here. He is taking this story and he has chosen to make it a fairly minor part of his narration of Jesus' ministry. He's going to mention it, but he's not going to emphasize it. Mark has chosen to emphasize it by giving nearly three times as much information. Now, when you telescope something, you have to make some decisions as to how you are going to present the information. And sometimes you can't keep it in strict chronological order when you're just summarizing things. So, let's take a look at one of the tensions, as they say. Notice Matthew 9, 18. While he was saying these things to them, a synagogue official came up and bowed down before him and said, what does he say? My daughter has just died. My daughter has just died. But come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Now look at Mark. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus. Notice Matthew doesn't even bother with names, but Mark does. And he came up, and on seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. Notice, at every point, Mark is expanding and giving a longer version than Matthew is. Matthew is summarizing. But the problem is... In Matthew's version, she is about to die, and in Mark's version, uh, I mean, in Mark's version, she's at the point of death, and in Matthew's version, she's already died. Now, you say, hmm, 
Anyone ever brought that up to you? Yeah, anybody ever seen my debate with Shabir Ali at, at Biola University? This is one of his primary examples of why we can't trust the New Testament. Thankfully, I had just gone through this in Sunday school. I've been teaching the Synoptic Gospels for a decade or more uh, at PRBC, and we had just covered this only a matter of months earlier. But how would you answer if you were in a situation, like I found myself, uh, in a conversation with a Muslim uh, in front of 2,500 people, raise this as an example of why we can't trust the text of the New Testament? Okay, I'll spend the next 20 minutes waiting for you. No, uh, Notice how much fuller this is. So what you have is you have Mark giving us the idea, my little daughter is at the point of death. Now here's one of the keys to why this is a clear example of telescoping on Matthew's part. Because look at the next. This is not a mistake on my part. In Mark 5, 35 through 36, while he was still speaking, so the woman with the issue of, of blood has come up. Jesus has healed her by the you know, touching of the garment, so on and so forth. Again, Mark gives more detail of that than Matthew does. Matthew just sort of barely mentions it. But while he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. <coughs> it's not in Matthew. Matthew has nothing about the men coming from the house. Doesn't even tell that part of the story. The point is, in Matthew, what he's communicating is that Jesus, when he arrives at the house, knows that the girl is dead. Mark gives us the much fuller information that when the man first came to Jesus, he didn't even know that she was yet dead, but on the way, found out that she was, which explains why by the time they get there, there are mourners at the house. But Matthew has had to make this shorter. He doesn't want to include all of this. Did he know about it? We're not told, but he makes the choice not to include it if he did. He is telescoping it. He is putting it together into a more, much more, a, a one-third length uh, rendition. And therefore, this part, which gives us the further information of the exact unfolding of the story it has it happened, is not found in Matthew because he does not choose to put the emphasis upon this that he otherwise would. This is what happens when you telescope something. Mark has the telescope all the way out. Matthew has put it down to its smallest, its smallest version. And sometimes we have stories in the Gospels where it's reversed or Mark's the longest and Matthew's like this and Luke is the shortest or something along those lines. But this happens a lot. This happens in any narration of history and it's happened in the comparison of the Gospels as well. And so here you have an example of exactly how that works, how telescoping uh, functions there in that story. Now, let me move to another one because I said it's already 9.02, and as you can tell, I'm already talking fast, and I've got a whole lot more to cover. So let me, uh, let me, let me press forward. Another real clear example of this is presented by Bart Ehrman. Remember, I mentioned him yesterday. He's one of the leading critics of uh, Christianity in, in, uh, in the English-speaking world today. And what you're going to hear if you go and listen to Bart Ehrman presenting why he doesn't believe that the Gospels are inspired and so on and so forth, and, and what you will hear in most liberal seminaries and Bible colleges and all the secular universities in the world, so on and so forth, is that there is a fundamental contradiction between the Gospel of John and the Synoptic Gospels as to the date on which Jesus died. They're going to say that Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a specific day that Jesus was died, Jesus died, and yet uh, John does not have that. So, there's a fundamental clear contradiction without possible explanation between the synoptics and John as to whether John ate the Passover, Jesus ate the Passover, and hence upon which day he was crucified, whether it was 14 or 15 Nisan, the, the date of that particular uh, month. The Passover lamb was slain the afternoon of Nisan 14. The Passover feast of unleavened bread began that day with the Passover meal that evening, beginning of Nisan 15. Remember, the Jewish day began at sunset. So if it's done in the evening, that's the first part of the next day. That really throws us off because we use the Roman system beginning at midnight. They did not do that. Uh, the day begins at sunset. So the beginning of Nisan 15 would be uh, right after sunset uh, of that particular uh, solar day. The synoptics all agree that on the first day of unleavened bread, Jesus sent Peter and John from Bethany to make preparation for eating the Passover meal. There are the relevant uh, portions 
relevant references. Clearly, in the synoptics, Jesus ate the normal Passover meal and hence was crucified on Nisan 15 the next day uh, for us as far as the uh, time period goes. Many scholars, including modern and mainly conservative scholars, have concluded that John has Jesus eat the Passover on Nisan 13 so that he is crucified at the same time as the Passover lamb on Nisan 14. So the idea is, well, John changes this to make a theological point, and that the theological point is that Jesus is the final Passover lamb. He is crucified at the same time the Passover lamb is being killed, and therefore you have the congruence, and it's all meant to be a wonderful Passover story, and you know we're to write songs about it and things like that, but it means that John's narration is not historical in its nature, okay? Now, there are five relevant passages in the Gospel of John to examine, and Bart Ehrman says that clearly John contradicts the synoptics, but is this so? That's the question. A couple things to remember. John chapter 13, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world, to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. So we clearly have this supper taking place. During the supper, this is what is taking place here in John chapter 13. It's called before the feast of the Passover. So what does that, how, how do we understand that? Uh, how do we understand this is a supper before the feast of the Passover? It is assumed on the basis of this being before the feast of the Passover, that this means this was 24 hours before, that is 13 Nisan. But this requires us to read feast of the Passover as referring only to the initial meal, not the entire celebration which lasted an entire week. In fact, most people today, when you think of Passover, you think of it as a a one-night thing. But it wasn't. It was an entire week-long festival and week-long celebration. So instead, the text speaks of Jesus doing things during the supper, which is clearly the normal Passover supper that is being celebrated and and, uh, discussed for us in John chapter 13. For example, in John 13, 27, then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Jesus had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. And so clearly that's directly in parallel with the uh, Synoptic Gospels. It is assumed the disciples would not have thought Judas Judas was going to make uh, preparations for the feast if the Passover meal itself was already over. Hence, this must be 13 Nisan, not 14. But there is no reason to limit the meaning of the feast to the Passover meal only, but to the entire Feast of Unleavened Bread, which makes the statement consistent with the Synoptic Gospels itself. And then in uh, John 18, 28, then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters. Why? So that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. Now, what does that mean? This is the next day. Obviously, therefore, when, when uh, it says, does eat the Passover mean simply the Paschal Supper? No. The term Passover is used eight times in John besides this instance, and each refers to the Passover festival, not simply to the single meal of the supper itself. And so they would not go in so they would not be made ritually impure and could not participate in the rest of the Passover week festivities is what John is referring to there and doing so very accurately. You'll notice in 2 Chronicles 30, 22, so they ate the food of the festival for how long? Seven days, since this comment is made early in the morning about the, the men not going into the, and becoming defiled. This must mean the, fast, the festival, not the supper alone, as any impurities would pass away at sundown. So this is talking about the entire festival, not the Passover meal, which had been the night before. So very, very clearly, when we look at the historical context We're getting the information that John is not trying to tell us something differently for some kind of theological reasons. Finally, John 19, 14, now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, behold your king. Now, what you need to understand is that, you know, does anybody speak uh, modern Greek in here? Any modern Greek speakers? We have one at our church uh, who, who attends on Sunday mornings. And uh, I asked him this one morning just to, just to prove to everybody this particular point. You know what the word for Friday is in modern Greek? It's paraskue, paraskue. You know what paraskue means in Greek? Preparation. 
For 2,000 years and beforehand, the name for Friday in Greek is preparation. Preparation day for the Sabbath. That's where it came from. It came from the Bible. And so when the Bible says it was preparation day, that's the same thing as saying it was Friday. So John directly says it was Friday. The problem is we translate it as preparation, and so we're going, okay, it could be preparation for, you know, maybe a special high day or something like that. But the reality is that was the day of the week. And so he very clearly says, now it was Friday. It was Friday of Passover week. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, behold your king. Uh, very clearly given to us in John chapter 19. And finally, John 19, 31, since it was the day of preparation, and so the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Every day of the festival was a high day, including the Sabbath of the festival. This does not mean the first day of the festival coincided with the Sabbath, altering the timeline. So we see that John is in harmony with the synoptics on this matter. So in many instances, the uh, accusation of contradiction, the accusation of disharmony is dealt with if we simply know what the historical context of the words being used and the practices, and that can sometimes be difficult. In fact, what happens when we have alleged problems in the Old Testament that go back to practices that we no longer have a great deal of information about? Might that not explain some of the problems we have in some of the Old Testament chronologies or issues like that? It's simply because we don't have enough of the background information. And if we don't have enough of the background information, wouldn't wisdom be innocent until proven guilty, not guilty until proven innocent? At least if we were handling the text properly, you would think that that would be the way that things are. Let me give you another example of historical context. When, at what hour was Jesus crucified? Now, if I had had more time, uh, both to make my presentation and to talk to you, I would show you a clip, but you can go watch it if you want to. If any of you are interested, go to the Alpha and Omega Ministries YouTube channel, find the debate on the crucifixion or crucifixion, F-I-C-T-I-O-N, that I just did in South Africa with um, Ayub Karim. And during the audience Q&A, you'll be able to watch a Muslim in full Muslim garb uh, come up to the microphone and ask me how I can believe what the Gospels say because the Gospels contradict themselves as to what hour Jesus was crucified. How can they be reliable if that is the case? Because, as you can see, in Mark 15, 25, it says it was the third hour when they crucified him. But, according to John, now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and, Jesus said to the, and he said to the Jews, behold your king. So, this is still the trial. The trial is still going on before the crucifixion at the sixth hour, but Mark has him crucified three hours earlier. My daughter's going, but do you know why, dear? Or are you just going to ask me? You know why? All right. Good. I did good. She was listening. All those years. Whiteboards in the back seat of the car. You know, that's just good. <laughs> Ask her. I did. Didn't I? Bought whiteboards to the kids. We'd be driving around. They're writing stuff on their whiteboards in the back of the car. Christian worldview issues. And Oh, I'm sorry. Anyways. <laughs> Seems like a long time ago. Um, there you have it. Uh, now, I'm going to explain this, but again, put yourself in the position you, uh, you've had to take a taxi ride to the airport, and your, your taxi driver is a Muslim, sees you have a Bible. Guess what? They're more likely to talk to you about religion than you are to talk to them about religion. And so they ask you this question. How are you going to respond? How are you going to respond? Well, I explained to the young fella, and he, he was uncertain about my explanation, so he actually came up to me later, gave me his email address, and said, could you send me more information on that? And, and I did. Uh, eventually, we, we, we hooked up. I sent him a whole big, long uh, thing on this. But here you have, here you have a, another instance where knowing something about the historical context will help you. And that is, we have not always told time in the same way. I mean, most of us today in here, I mean, I'm wearing a GPS watch. This is a, a Garmin running watch. And so when it gets a GPS fix, I, I, I did a five-mile run a couple days ago, and so it's still got a good GPS fix, so it knows exactly what time it is here. So it's right on time. And you all have your cell phones, and so we, we're, we're pretty good on time these days, right? Uh, it hasn't always been that way. 
And not only that, but telling time, starting at midnight, that's the Roman way of doing things. That wasn't the Jewish way. The Jewish day started at sunset. And even the hours would change length depending on the time of the year. Because what you do is you divide, you would divide the, the period of daylight into 12 segments. So during the summer, those would be longer segments. During the winter, they'd be shorter segments. You still had 12 segments. But they would be the ones that would change. I mean, try to make a wristwatch that would handle that. That would be really weird. So certain people started the days at sunrise and certain people at sunset. And there were all sorts of different ways of doing it. Now, the Jewish way of doing it would have been to start the day at sunset, but then the morning hour, the daylight hours would be at sunrise, so third hour would be around three hours from the time that the sunlight hours began. But John doesn't use that time system at all. Well, why wouldn't he? Again, historically. Why would he? If he is writing late, and if he is writing in Ephesus, and hence is not writing to people who have ever lived in Palestine or would ever live in Palestine, and especially if it is after the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, then why not use the time system that people would be familiar with so as to not introduce an unnecessary confusion? And so John uses Roman time, Matthew, Mark, and Luke use Jewish time, and when you when you allow the two of them to come together, they're saying the same thing. Now, we don't know the exact hour of Jesus' crucifixion because we're not told. We're told it, it was the third hour in the crucif third hour since when? Since sunrise. Well, sunrise isn't the same time every single day, depending on where you are in the year. Obviously, it changes. And I'm not even talking about that silly thing called daylight savings time, what you people do. I live in Arizona. You realize we don't do that. Uh, we honor time. We realize God made it. So you can fall back, trip forward, do whatever the stuff it is you do, and we just keep right on going, because we tried it once in 1977, and in July, it would be 10 o'clock at night, still light and 110 degrees. Does not work. Does not work. And we said, forget it, and so there you go. So as long as you know the background differences, you know the historical context, there you go. You see what the difference between those uh, two particular issues are. Now, we press forward. And we hope that it only goes, okay, just one. Thank you. All right. Really quickly on this one, I had an atheist years ago throw this out. Dennis McKenzie of Biblical Errancy. Now, it's, now he's online and stuff. But back then, he would send out a three-page mimeographed thing about all the errors in the Bible. And uh, here is one of them that he threw out. In Matthew 19, 18, the King James Version, it says, thou shalt not murder. But in Romans 13, 9, it says, thou shalt not kill. And they're both renditions of the Ten Commandments, and we all know that murdering and killing are not the same thing, right? So the Bible contradicts itself, right? Well, they had to use the King James Version for a reason here. Uh, your modern translations will both say, thou shalt not kill or murder. They'll be consistent one way or the other. The reason being that the underlying text is oof on usais in both. It's identical. And so what you've identified here is an inconsistency in the King James translation. Sorry if we have any King James-only folks in the room. Um, but the reality is, if you know something about the history of the King James, it was translated by different committees at different places. And when the final product was put together, there wasn't necessarily the kind of um, harmonization of translation. They were all translating the same text. There isn't a difference in the underlying text at all. It's just they chose to use different words. And it was different committees that did it, and it ended up in the printed edition. And so you need to recognize when people are trying to create a contradiction based upon a translation rather than upon the original language. Very, very often that is where the issue is coming from. Be very, very careful, especially when you find folks trying to go back to older translations to create a contradiction that really isn't there. Always look to the original language. Now, there is also textual context textual context, and that is there are differences between Greek manuscripts, and you'll all have little notes at the bottom of your page uh, that say some manuscripts say this and some manuscripts say that. You need to pay attention to them. Uh, those of you who are my age uh, who uh, uh, can no longer read any fonts below 11 points, um, there are notes down there. Those are not smudges. I know you thought they were, um, but those things down there are actually notes and uh, if you'll get progressive lenses like mine, you will find them again. They, they will be, they'll, they'll, they'll come back into your vision. And um, we, need, we need to be aware of why those notes are down there. They're very, very useful. 
Uh, but let me give you an example. Um, we had a guy come up to us. We were passing out tracts in Salt Lake City once. And he said, what, what translation of the Bible do you use? Boy, I knew where this was going. And uh, I said, well, we use a number of different ones. He says, well, do you use the bloodless Bible? I don't know. I've never cut it. <laughs> you know, so. I knew where he was going, but he was talking about Colossians 1.14. Because in King James Version, it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The NIV says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so if you just look at that, you go, oh, those liberal NIV translators, as if they were actually liberal NIV translators, uh, they don't believe in, in, in forgiveness through the blood of Christ, and so they've taken it out, and it's the bloodless Bible. <sighs> well, there is a textual variant here, but it is interesting. I pointed the guy, I said, you know, if the NIV was trying to get rid of the blood of Christ, why is it that we can go to Ephesians 1 7, which is the parallel to Colossians? Ephesians and Colossians have a lot of parallel passages. The very same parallel, and it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace in the King James, and in the NIV, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of God's grace. How come they didn't take it out there? Well, you know, you're just weakening it a little bit. You know, it's, it's not found as often that way, is the idea. Well, the reality is that. By far the best text, and in fact, what's interesting, the majority text, the Byzantine text platform, all read as the NIV does here and not as the King James. There are only a small number, about nine very late manuscripts. And you know what happened here is obviously someone who had memorized the Ephesians version in copying the Colossians version, probably inadvertently because they had memorized it, inserted the phrase into Colossians just because it was the natural way they, they knew the passage. Uh, Ephesians 1 had been used in liturgical settings for a long, long time. So it, it may not even been that someone said, well, I think this needs to be here. It could have been absolutely uh, without malice or an attempt to alter anything. But the point is, the vast majority of Greek manuscripts and all of the Greek manuscripts before the year 1000 of the book of Colossians read as the NIV does, not as the King James does. And when we get into the textual area, don't have time to unfold it today, I want to know what Paul wrote, not what someone a thousand years later thought Paul should have written. And that's the key issue. That's the key issue there. Lots of stuff on the textual issue that we can, uh, we can get into, but um, I'm gonna, I've saved the last and the toughest for the end. If you're starting to fade a little bit, if you see the person, uh, ladies, if, if the husband is starting to do this thing, you know, the caffeine's wearing off. Uh, hit him in the ribs. Uh, husbands, if your wife's doing that, don't touch her. <laughs> bad thing to do. Very bad. Just let her go. It's okay. Unless she snores. Then that bothers me. Okay, so then, then you might want to do something. But just, just whisper in your ear, sail it, Ross. Sail it, Ross. And she'll wake up. That's what works for me. <laughs> the, the, the ladies at Ross know my wife's middle name. <laughs> Not just first name, know her middle name too. Okay, intertextual context. What on earth am I talking about here? I almost didn't do this. I almost didn't do this. I'm still worried about doing it. This could be the single toughest issue in New Testament studies that I know of. Could be. So, in a sense, I am um, expecting much of you and hopefully showing you respect to challenge you on this because I feel that we should challenge believers in the context where we are here much more readily than out there. This is the place to do it. So what do I mean when I say intertextual context? Well, some of the toughest questions are when the Bible quotes itself. When the Bible quotes itself, especially when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. Now, we know that the Old Testament was written primarily in what's called Hebrew. There are about 12 chapters approximately in Aramaic and a few phrases here, there, and everywhere in Aramaic, but Aramaic's are very closely related language to, uh, to Hebrew, and the New Testament was written in Greek, and I'm sorry if you've run into the Hebrew roots guys that are running around saying it was written in Hebrew and all the rest of that stuff. That is just silliness. It is just silliness. It really is. I'm sorry. 
uh, but, but on every ground that you can examine an ancient text on. Even Matthew, which is about the only book in the New Testament where we've got any external allegations uh, that it was written in another language, even Matthew demonstrates that its original language was Greek. It is not a translation from something else or anything like that. So leaving that issue to the side. When the New Testament writers quote from the Old Testament, which they do constantly, that's one of the wonderful things about the New American Standard, you can't avoid seeing Old Testament citations because they're in all caps, which makes it impossible to use for blog entries, but it's wonderful for reading because they put the Old Testament citations in all capital letters. But when the New Testament cites the Old Testament, what version does it cite? Oh, well, the Hebrew. No. A couple times, yeah, but for the vast majority of times, it doesn't quote the Hebrew. It quotes the Greek Septuagint. The Greek Septuagint. Now, the Greek Septuagint was translated somewhere between 250 and 200 years before Christ. It wasn't all done at one place. It's not all of, of equal quality. The Pentateuch is really good. Some of the Psalms are really good. Some of the Minor Prophets, not so good. Some of the historical books, not so good. It's of differing quality. It was done by differing people. There were different sort of versions of it, so there might even be some differences between uh, some of the Septuagint manuscripts that existed in that day. But the fact is, the Bible of the early church was the Greek Bible. If you lived in Colossae and you don't have a New Testament, what are you going to have? You're going to have the Greek Old Testament. You're going to have the Septuagint. That's going to be the Bible that is going to be being used while the New Testament is being written. You don't even know there's such a thing called the New Testament as far as a, a, a canon of books at that particular point in time. And so if you're writing to the church at Colossae and you want to quote the Old Testament, are you going to quote it from a version that they can't read? Or are you going to quote it from the one that they're reading every day in church? Pretty obvious, isn't it? And so the vast majority of the citations of the Old Testament found in the New Testament are from the Greek Septuagint, which also means there are times when the Greek Septuagint differs from the Hebrew. Now, could I just very quickly warn you all off from making a huge mistake, a huge apologetic mistake? How many of you have heard about the Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls? The Isaiah scroll, yeah. Oh, isn't the Isaiah scroll great? I mean... The earliest manuscript we had of Isaiah was from 900 years after Christ, and it was a Masoretic text. And then we found the Dead Sea Scroll, and it's 100 years before Christ. And guess what? There's almost no change at all. It's pretty much identical. Isn't that awesome? And that's exactly true. It's exactly true. But did you know that the version of Jeremiah from the Dead Sea Scrolls is one-third shorter? See, we throw out the true part, but we don't know the whole story, and I saw it happen. Man, I saw it coming. It was in the Q&A section of my debate with Bart Ehrman, and up comes this guy, and he's going to show this fellow, he's going to show this unbelieving fellow what for, and he, and I can just see, I can just see Ehrman going, wow, Woo! right over the fence. So he is, just saw it coming, just saw it coming. Be very careful. Tell the truth, it is true, but it's not the whole story, and that's the problem. That's the problem. There are places where the Greek Septuagint varies from the Hebrew. Here's one of them. Look at Jeremiah 31, 32. Now, this is important theologically, folks. We talk about the New Covenant all the time, and Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8, really, really important stuff. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, Jeremiah 31, 32, from the Hebrew Masoretic text. But when it's quoted in Hebrews 8, 9, the writer of the Hebrews doesn't use the Hebrew. He uses the Greek Septuagint, as he consistently does through his book, which is interesting. And how does he render that last phrase? And I did not care for them, says the Lord. Now, I don't know about you. But um, those are not synonymous phrases. At least they better not be. Right? So what do you do with that? Especially because the version that the writer of the Hebrews quotes even more greatly supports his point that he's making about the better covenant Versus the old covenant, there's a new covenant with a new mediator, new mediator and new, new promises, better promises, it's better promises, not new, new promises. So it, it helps support his point. 
And this isn't the only place where this happens. There are a couple places. There are a number of places. Probably near a dozen, I'd say. Where the New Testament cites what is a textual variant between the Greek Septuagint and the Hebrew Masoretic text. Now, let me just show you why. Well, here's... There we go. Keynote refused to work with me yesterday morning when it came to Greek and Hebrew, so I had to use images instead of using the original languages. But here is the, the Hebrew term right here, and it, it's ba'alti, ba'al, you, you've heard of Baal? That's really ba'al, and ba'al means lord or husband. So in the Hebrew, I... Baal, a husband to them, saith the Lord. But in the Greek Septuagint, and I did not care for them. And in the book of Hebrews, it's actually a slight difference in Septuagint. They, they, they allied Kai and Ego, so it just becomes one word, but it doesn't change anything. I did not care for them. What's the difference between the two? Well, again, I would have liked to have used the Hebrew, but I, I, I had to transliterate. Baal is the word for husband, Ga'al means to despise or not care for. And if you know Hebrew, you know that the gimel and the bet are very, very similar to one another. So there is a slight difference in one letter between the two readings. That's where the variant came from. But what this tells us is trying to establish one ancient line of the text, specifically the Masoretic text, as the standard is rather dangerous. We need to let the New Testament writers tell us which ones we should be using. And the Greek Septuagint is extremely important in looking and interpreting the New Testament and knowing what the background passages are. Now, there's a bunch of these that I could show you. And I don't have a comfortable answer for you for some of the ramifications this might raise, but I think it's far more important that you know about them and think about them than to be all of a sudden hit by something like this, and the first thought across your mind is, how come all those preachers and teachers I've listened to for years never told me about anything like this? You know, there's a statement that Paul made to the Ephesian elders that is part and parcel of what motivates me, and that is, I am innocent of the blood of all men. Why? Why? Because I did not shrink back from proclaiming to you the whole counsel of God. I've let you know. I I want you to be fully prepared and to think these things through. Which even includes thinking through tough things like the relationship between the Greek Septuagint and the Hebrew text. And recognizing that the later Hebrew Masoretic text comes 900 years after Jesus. And like I said briefly yesterday morning just in passing... That means they put vowel pointing in that is anti-Christian, like at Psalm 110.1, because they well knew what the key passages were 900 years after Christ, and so we have to keep that in mind. We always have to test our traditions, because there are some some realms, there are some strains amongst Reformed folks that makes the Masoretic text the final uh, arbiter of all things, and I, I just don't see how it works. So you need to know something about the intertextual context as well. Let's come to our summary because I am out of time. Uh, There we go. The Bible is a collection of books written in two primary languages by more than 40 authors over the span of 1,500 years. Never forget that. Never forget what we're really handling is not a single volume written by a single person at a single time. God chose to use, God chose to bring us His Word The world changed a bit in 1,500 years. Kingdoms rose and fell. Languages changed. Politics changed. And while we in the West might wish that the Bible is more like a printer manual or an encyclopedia, where you can go, I want to know about doctrine of God. Click, boom, there it is. Paragraph 1, paragraph 2, sub-point A, sub-point B. That's what a lot of people would like the Bible to be. It would be a whole lot easier for me as an apologist if that's the way it was. But that's not how God worked, and in fact, given this is a story of God entering into this messy world in the person of His Son, would we really expect the Bible to be a Western product that looks like a printer manual rather than the book that contains books like Joshua and Judges, 
Ezekiel. Man, Ezekiel did some weird things. Yeah, the Bible is different than we might want it to be, but that's the way that it is. That's the way God's given it to us. Therefore, its coherence and harmony is found not in a surface-level uniformity or simplicity, but a deep interior presentation of glorious threads of truth woven throughout its historical narrative. And I've really become captured with this, this illustration I've used of the idea of the threads in a tapestry and how you can follow a thread from the very beginning, the, the one side of the tapestry all the way through to the other. And it may not look the same when it comes out here, but there is a connection and it's the beauty of that connection and the colors it takes on as it goes through that process, as it goes through that history that makes it so glorious. And you don't get that in a five-week Bible study. And no one has ever traced all the beautiful, glorious threads of God's truth in this life. We're not smart enough, and we don't live long enough. But I'm awful glad the Bible's not a printer manual, because you know what? I could, I could pretty much master a printer manual, no matter how complex that stupid printer really is. But I will never be able to master all that's found in the Word of God. Its depth, its beauty the interwoven nature of its character will always challenge me. And the real question is, do I approach it as one who humbly desires to learn and to submit myself to my master who has spoken therein, or do I approach it with the critical spirit that you need to meet my criteria? That's going to be all the difference in the world. It's going to be all the difference in the world. And I am firmly convinced that when the Spirit of God gives us a heart of flesh, that heart of flesh is in subservience to the Word of God. I believe that's part of regeneration. And when I meet a person who is willing to stand up and to critically, not critically examine, I critically examine the text all the time. That's where some of the greatest light comes from. But to, in a sense, be critical of the very idea that God could have spoken in such a fashion, I'm worried about that person. I am very, very worried on a pastoral level about that person. You awake now? I threw a lot of stuff at you. I talked really fast. That's why they recorded it. So use, use the feature in, on your iPod to go to half speed, and that will make more sense. It really will next time around when you listen to it. But I thank you for your attention. I hope that this will just be a way of, of jump-starting some thoughts on your part and maybe some study on your part to understand what the context and background of the text of Scripture is, but to not start with the guilty until proven innocent, but innocent until proven guilty because there's a lot that we need to know. All right? All right, let's close the word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for this time that we have had to consider these things, and though, Lord, we, we struggle at times with the riches of your word and the depth of your word and, and the fact that your word presents us with, with difficulties to our mind's eye, that, Lord, as we invest the time, as we fairly handle your word, we discover that you indeed not only have preserved it for us, but you gave it to us originally, you you gave us that God-breathed revelation. And Lord, we would ask that we would be good students of it, that as we have opportunity to give testimony to the truthfulness of your word, that you would bless our words, that you would use us to be salt and light in this world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.